<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Give me one second for preparing for the slides. By the way, the slides are on the website, so please feel free to download those. All right, so okay, so today we're going to talk about D five mainly and some other models too. So, um after BERT basically. So we talk about BERT last lecture, remember? And um, that basically opened the um, era of uh, large pretty language models. And um, there were a lot of uh, variants. So actually, I think the purpose of this lecture would be, uh, one is definitely to learn about one of the major advancements, which is T5. Um, but also number two is that since there were so many models, I think it's worth um, talking about a few of them, especially, giving you an uh, basically idea what kind of um, tries, what kind of, um, what kind of what kind of things people have tried basically. So, and so uh, uh, two announcements. First of all, um, it's again, uh, time to do your assignment. It's last assignment. Assignment four will be released today and it will be due in two weeks. Uh, it will be June 7th. Note that um, our last lecture will be I mean, our last class will be June 9th. So that week will be your last class classes. And we're gonna actually have a, um, um, I mean, the, the week after that, it would be the final exam week. So we don't have any um, class on that week. And you can still use your uh, no penalty late days for, for assignment four and also final project. I think initially I said that the final project is not eligible for um, no, no, uh, the no, no, no penalty late day, but uh, I, I think uh, we changed the policy. So instead, um, we're being more lenient on that. So you can actually do, uh, I mean, you can actually submit that um, seven days after that, up to if you have no penalty late days left. Okay, so and the ass assignment four will be about BERT and T5. I mean, basically using them to create an open domain tree system. So. Um, it'll be more of, um, I mean, you'll be using hugging face, so it's not so much coding, it's more of a, I would say, uh, learning to use uh, these pretend language models. So today's lecture will be, first of all, a, a bit more about the variants of BERT, 
we had we went over a few last time i think and number two is that we're going to go over the pretend language model for encoder decoder and number three bart and then t5 we're going to talk about t5 more than the others though okay so I think everyone remembers how the bird was, um, what the bird looked like. So uh, there are a few, now after a bird has been released, there are a few directions people have um, worked on. So one of them is actually how to basically reduce the complexity of bird. So how can we make bird faster and also more lightweight? And one of them, was actually trying to reduce the parameters by having some sort of um, uh, factorization. So they have some bottleneck. If you have bottleneck, if you have bottlenecked um, layers that replace your fully connected layers, then that usually actually reduce the parameters, right? Because um, for instance, suppose that, um, I'll give an example. Um, suppose that you have a um, input vector x and then you multiply uh, matrix ax then this a is basically um, if x is um, d-dimensional vector then a will be d by d right so that means you have a d square parameters here but then let's say that you factorize this into for instance um, ABX, where um, still X is d-dimensional, but then now let's say um, let's say that the B is well, it's a bit confusing to do this way, but then let's say that the uh, B is um, you want to um, actually I'll do the other way. It's very confusing to do this way, um, and what I'm saying is that let's say that we're going from X to A, okay? Then it's X is one by D and A is uh, D by D. Then XA will be of course um, one by D as well, right? Because uh, we have this cancellation out. But then uh, suppose that we formulate this into um, X A B where X is still um, one, one by D, but then now we have uh, A is, um, I'll use different notation in fact, um, B C where B is now D by um, some value say K and C is K by B. Then one thing to note is that still X times B times C is um, one by D dimensional matrix because you just still cancel this out. But then what if um, K is much smaller than D? Then what that means is then you're, you now have much less number of parameters because here the number of parameter is um, two times D times K, which will be much less than uh, D square, right? So that's the um, basically the factorization happening. So uh, it's it's good to know really this technique because it will be actually being it's still it's it's being used a lot these days, especially uh, for instance um, when you're using adopters. Um, although it's not really scope of this class, but then you see why that can be useful because if you want to have some sort of a D to D. Uh, function or I mean some matrix that maps from the dimensional vector to the dimensional vector but you still want to do that without using too much parameters then uh, this kind of technique can be useful and of course um, parameter sharing also helps you to reduce the parameters right apparently but what that means is that in BERT you do not share parameters across different layers so every layer has uh, its own unique parameters, but if you do parameter sharing, then maybe layer one and layer two have the same parameters, then the, apparently you will be saving parameters, usually at the cost of the performance, but um, they're trying to reduce the parameters, so it's it's not too bad. So there are lower memory consumption. 
And because of defactorization, it increases training speed of birth. So that's a pretty good thing. Um, there's an inter-sentence coherence objective that's just an extra objective to train the preterm language model. They showed better results on glue, race, and squad with fewer parameters than bird large. Remember that uh, bird large has uh, 340 million parameters. So it's good to know these numbers because it will come back to you again and again a lot. So by the way, bird base is uh, 110 million parameters. Another um, popular, I think, work that drew a lot of attention was the um, Electron that was also released in 2020. Um, so really the interesting thing about this is that uh, it focused on the sample efficiency of uh, during the pre-training. So if you th think about birds, um, they say it's not sample efficient because what they mean by is that, let's say your input size is um, say 32. If you want to mask some of the tokens, then you will, let's say your sample or your masking ratio is like 20%. Or 20, let's say 25%, then one over four, right? So that means that if you have 32 tokens, then uh, if your input size is um, 32, then number of uh, masking will be eight, right? Because 25%. So then in, in that case, then you are masking eight tokens, and um, that's a what they're saying, saying is that's very inefficient because you need to have, um, because you're, you're only, yeah, your loss will be only on these mask tokens, right? Because you want to guess what those words are. But then if you didn't mask the, the tokens, then there's nothing to really train for because it's just the same word from the input side. So um, what they're saying is then their sample efficiency of um, this BERT will be 25%. And they're not happy with that because um, that's very, not efficient, they want to increase this. But of course, if you mask too, many, too much, then that will be also not possible. If you, let's say, mask 100%, then it's impossible to guess the original text because there is no notion of context. So they actually came up with a pretty, quite a smart idea, which is um, they still uh, cor uh, corrupt the input side. But then um, the interesting thing is that they, basically corrupt it in a way that they first mask with the same mechanism like here. So this is the same mechanism as BERT, this masking things. But then you use generator, you create a generator to actually create a word for this mask. So this is very similar to actually BERT, right? Because that's what the BERT is doing. But then after that, and after that, um, and basically they can generate this by sampling. So it doesn't have to be deterministic. They can actually have different words every time because it will be just sampling from the top K candidates for those mask words. And then what the discriminator does is that it's trying to guess which word is original and which word was replaced. So in this case, the will be original. Well, I mean, that's actually not true. I mean, the is original because, I mean, that, that's true actually I'm saying, uh, because it's actually equivalent to the original word. And chef is also original word. So it doesn't matter whether it was generated by the uh, generator or it was not masked in the first place. What matters is that whether each word is actually same as or different from the original input sequence. So this is original input sequence and you're comparing that with this. So the is same. Chef is the same, but cooked became eight, so this is not same. And da is same, but meal is same as well. That's why original, original, but um, replaced original and original. Okay. So you might be wondering that isn't this just using two models and why is it more efficient? And what they're arguing was that, um, well, they can create a very small generator. Generator doesn't have to be big. So it can be even smaller than the bird base, but then they want to make this discriminator sufficiently big. 
And that's what you're calling, what they're calling Electra. So they're using the generator for just as a more of, a, I would say, um, assistant, right? Or some sort of um, helper. But then what really matters is the discriminator that you're using. And this can be very big. So this is oftentimes quite big and this is small. So you can almost ignore the um, computational cost of the small model. What you really care about is the big model, but then uh, for the big model, um, the, um, you, can, you can now sample efficiency of 100% because you actually give loss to every token instead of just, just those that are masked. So that's exactly the, um, the good, good part of the um, Electra. And what they actually saw is that the, uh, it's more effective and efficient than the BERT because the task is defined over all input tokens. And the gains are particularly strong for small models. So uh, even these days, I think many small models use Electra instead of BERT. And good thing about that, again, is that um, BERT, uh, uh, Electra, just like BERT, they can use exactly the same architecture. Although I don't remember exactly whether they are using the exactly same architecture, but just like Roberta, this might be replaced just um, out of the box without any hassles. Another direction is, again, actually, again, this is about also efficiency. I think all these works are usually about efficiency. Um, um, the fact that uh, BERT is not suitable for edge devices. Edge devices refer to um, basically devices that you're touching, like mobile devices, or even like your um, refrigerators or your uh, whatever you have that you use. And these devices don't have connections to the server. Actually, there are some questions I saw. Okay. Okay, the question from uh, Yetan is that, are they both using encoder architecture? I think you're talking about Electra and yes, the answer is yes, yeah. So they're not using the encoder side. They're just using the uh, transformers encoder. So back to mobile BERT. Um, so BERT is not suitable for edge devices because they're too big. Um, I told you it's uh, uh, 340 million parameters, which is translating into, even if you use half precision, this is at least uh, 680 megabytes, right? which is quite big for um, any, um, it, for instance, you, you don't want to download probably such app that just has, uh, that's taking up like one gigabyte for just the model inside. So what this mobile board was interested was compressing and accelerating birds for edge devices uh, at the cost of losing some accuracy. So they're equipped with the bottleneck structure. So this is a similar thing to what I talk about vectorization. So um, they, basically replace the fully connected layers with uh, this, um, you know, made two matrices that bottleneck and then expand again so that they can reduce the number of parameters. Also op number of operations. And they also have uh, some balancing between self-attention and feed forward. So, <clears throat> and they do a lot of distillation from BERT large. And at the end, it's able to actually achieve 4.3 smaller and 5.5 times faster um, inference speed. Not training, by the way. You don't have to train on the edge device. On bird base, but then still achieve similar results. So if you're using bird base, then maybe it's just a good idea to use mobile bird because um, anyways, they're doing similar, um, although it's not always the case, but um, in many cases, mobile bird can be as good as bird base and still be faster and smaller. Okay. Another direction was to handle text data that's not one dimensional. So for instance, if you're looking at these like um, 2D structured text like receipts or uh, this is invoice, the important thing about in understanding these documents is that um, they come, they have a uh, spatial information, right? So, for instance, 
if you're if you want to understand what this number means, like this price here, uh, the meaning of that word is implied by where it is, not just the contextual text, right? Um, you will know what this means only if you, you are seeing this in such spatial context. Let's say if I just uh, serialize this into one um, text, like you just make a serialization of this and then try to understand what that is. Of course you might be able to, but still it'd be very difficult. And it will be even more difficult for the invoice because now you have these columns, right? And then um, you don't even really, you can like clearly know what the number means unless you take in, you, you look at into it very carefully. And in some cases it's impossible. So what, what, um, what the layout LM was trying to do is the fact that if you want to do some language understanding for these 2D text or these uh, text from the images, then you need to somehow give the spatial information to the, some, um, to the, to the pretend language model. Um, and maybe you want to also convey this information during pre-training because uh, you also want to make sure that during pre-training, this, this spatial information also um, get, are learned basically, right? So that's what Leo LM did exactly. So basically they serialize it, but then they basically have a position embedding for um, this 2D structure. And then um, they show that using this Leo LM, they can achieve state of the art in the, um, these receipts form understandings compared to BERT or some 1D text-based pre-trained language model. So it's quite suitable for um, information extraction for semi-structured documents. And it's also worth noting into, uh, looking into another paper called Bros, it's from Neighbor. It's all, if you're interested in this direction, feel free to also take a look at these things. Um, these are great, these are great, but then, um, now you might be wondering, that's great, but well, they can be only doing the classification task, right? These are applicable to sequence or token classification. But remember that chart that I show you, we, we have a few different formulations and we, we had four formulations. Of course, it can be more fine grained, but I usually um, classify these formulations into four uh, token sequence, generation and took uh, token cl sequence, cl sequence classification, token classification, retrieval and generation. And retrieval is kind of similar to sequence classification because you need to have the embeddings. But then what about the generation? And can we, Bert cannot do generation because it's it only has the encoder of transformer. Then now the question is, can we create a pretend model for um, encoder decoder architecture? like the full transformer. So in that case, then we can have an input and then we can have the output as a sequence instead of uh, just class labels. In other words, how can we create a denoising autoencoder for encoder decoder? And if you're trying to do that, um, how can we inject a noise to the input and how we will reconstruct it? So let's say we're trying to follow the same paradigm of BERT, which is denoising autoencoder, then Denoising order encoder is basically injecting a noise first and then trying to construct the original input without the noise. Um, so we need it's two step process, right? Um, number one, how do we inject noise? And number two, how do we reconstruct it? So um, one of the um, first approaches for this is actually BART. It's from FAIR, Facebook AI Research. And this is for the sequence to sequence pre-training. So um, it's using the entire transformer. So it means that there is an encoder side and there is a decoder too. Um, it's still a denoising order encoder in the sense that the text is corrupted with an arbitrary noising function. So it's like, as you see, very similar to BERT, you have uh, these empty or in BERT masked tokens, they're randomly sampled and they're same encoder that BERT uses. So if this was just trained here, then this would be just BERT. But uh, the training loss is not on the encoder side directly, but actually it's on the decoder side. And what the decoder is trained to do 
is try to reject or reconstruct the entire input, um, basically the original input, including the these erased ones. So, um, well, as you see, it's basically wait. Um, hmm. Now I'm a, bit, I'm a bit confused because, as you see, uh, so it's probably, um, as far as I know, if I remember correctly, because I have been using BERT BART recently, it's not just a one token masking. So basically, here you have uh, your original, let's say, it was um, then um, you're putting this space here. And you're putting space in instead of a CD, but there's nothing between A and B, so this is just a null. And uh, there is a C and D between B and, uh, B and E, so this is a C and D. But then um, you're trying to reconstruct everything uh, like this, not just the uh, the words that are masked. So that's a bit different from BERT, right? You're trying to generate everything and. The, uh, that just makes the test quite simple. Uh, we don't have to worry about which words are really masked. So it can be, um, it can be relatively simple. And um, they basically tree train on this. They just try to uh, train this on a similar corpus to birds. And they sh show that actually, number one, of course, uh, this can be used for various sick to sick tasks. Uh, but number two, also they saw that they can also use the just the encoder side after training with the decoder though. So basically they can, after pre-training for the fine training, they can just use this um, encoder side and then that can be used towards similar tasks that are being used for with the birds. Okay, so um, now T5 is, uh, something that we're gonna talk about a lot today. It's quite similar to BART and they were actually concurrent work. Uh, we cannot say that one was necessarily influenced a lot by the other because they were released on the same date. The archiving date was around the late, 2020, late 2019 and the actual publication dates are 2020. So basically exactly one year after BERT because BERT was uh, first released on archive in, um, late 2018, like October 2018. And the T5, I think, was something like uh, October as well in 2019. And BART was a bit later, I think. But uh, I think both are used a lot these days. But if I had to choose which is used a bit more, I think T5 is be, being used uh, a bit more, especially given that um, T5 is quite native to the um, TensorFlow. So it, you can actually speed up quite easily and also uh, a lot of follow-up work was based on T5. So uh, T5 is a uh, standing for text to text transfer transformer. So um, we have uh, actually only four T. Okay, maybe I'm missing T here. Um, so sequence to sequence print training just like BART, but uh, the difference, a uh, key difference is that in fact, they still erase some parts of the input text and that can be not just one token, but uh, some consecu uh, cons consecutive tokens like this for inviting and last. They basically erase this, but then um, after they erase it, they have special token to indicate that there is something going in. But interesting thing here is that uh, instead of trying to reconstruct the entire original input, what they try to do is they actually try to just generate the um, the these masked ones, so that's exactly corresponding to for inviting and last. So basically, it's kind of like targets. They start with the special token to indicate that you're going to generate the um, the uh, what's been missing there, and then that's exactly for inviting. And then Y is again what's missing in Y and then they try to generate last and then just end with Z. That's one way to view it. Another way to view it is that um, it's kind of switching between inputs and targets. So thank you and X correspond to each other. X and for inviting corresponds to each other. Y and um, me to your party corresponds to each other and last and Y and Z to weak. So there are several ways to look at it, but at the end it's the same thing. 
But the good thing about this is that um, it basically has much less number of tokens to decode at the output side. And still it's avoiding, basically it's avoiding trivial task, which is copying, copying the input. BART has to do that because it's copying the input from the original text, even if it's explicitly given, but in T5, uh, you're not doing that. You're only generating what's missing in the inputs. So that's like one key difference in the pre-training scheme. There are actually other details that makes T5 different from BART. So in fact, T5 is larger and also has some, in my opinion, I think uh, more carefully constructed training data. So um, there, are, it's quite a large model too. Um, if remember that BERT was, uh, how many parameters were there? 340 million, right? So that means 0.3 billion parameters. So BERT was a uh, 0.3 billion, but now T5 goes, goes up to 11 billion. So that's how many times? That's like almost 40 times. So it becomes much larger. Now, BERT at least was, you can, you can actually perform inference pretty easily with a single GPU. All the training was a bit hard, but fine tuning was still not too much difficult with the one GPU or a few GPUs and inference is definitely doable with one GPU. But now T5, it's now you have to even think about whether you can put this into one model without offloading. With offloading is something that you can actually use these days pretty easily. You're basically um, storing some of the, some portion of the model or some optimizer or some portion of the model in the memory instead of GPU and loading it as you need. It's quite necessary for models as large as a T5, whether it's during training or inference, but that's not the scope of this class. Um, maybe we can talk about offloading in, in the um, large language model class, but uh, in this class, we're just gonna say that it's quite a large model and it's trained on one trillion tokens as well. So it's very large too, right? Because uh, remember that the BERT was only trained on 3 billion tokens. So now you have like 300 times more um, data. Although um, at the end, well, I mean, it's not really 1 trillion tokens because they do a lot of uh, filterings. And um, at the end, how many, how many tokens do we need? That's really a question good important question because it hasn't increased like crazy though, at least recently. So they think that um, just increasing the data size is not probably the answer, but some people think also increased data size is important. So there are a lot of uh, debates over this, but it's clear that, um, well, I think 3 billion is not enough. It's, it, this is not definitely enough. Um, GPT was for instance, GPT-3 for instance was trained uh, with 500 billion tokens. So um, it's GPT-3 was not much larger than T5 in terms of data. GPT-3 was also 175 billion parameters. So it was about 10 times larger, but not like uh, crazily larger for your information. But T5, it's, it's worth noting, uh, worth actually taking a closer look into T5. So, T5 has a bit different architecture from um, Transformer, but not too much. It's quite very similar to original Transformer. Uh, T5 was, by the way, also from Google. So actually, yeah, Google was driving this really um, very well in the early, I think, especially in the early uh, pre-training language model stage because T5, a Transformer um, 2017, um, BERT, well, 2019-ish and T5 2020, they were all from Google. And so, yeah, um, they were doing really well. I mean, they're doing well right now too, but they're especially were doing well. These days, I think there are too many players. Um, the difference between T5 and the T5's transformer, to be more exact, and the original transformer is that um, they remove the bias in layer norm. So remember the layer norm has two, comp two, uh, very, uh, two parameters. One is uh, the scale vector and the other is bias vector, but they remove the bias vector. Um, they place this layer norm outside of the residual path. That means um, if you remember the, T5, uh, the transformer, original transformer, they had the layer norm within the, um, I mean, the, the residual path was outside of the layer norm, but then they did this the other way. 
Um, and the um, number three is that they use a simplified form of relative position embedding. So we talk about this briefly after trans in, the, in the transformer lecture. Uh, relative position embedding is usually more powerful than the absolute one because what matters is the relationship between the um, words than the um, where they are in the absolute in the absolute sense. And the it's very simplified in in sense that uh, first of all it's hat sensitive but layer agnostic. What that means is that um, you will have a different relative position embedding per hat. I mean, they're, they're not sharing parameters, but then they will be same across all the layers. So let's say you have, uh, for instance, um, 16 hats, then that means then you will have uh, 16 different parameters because you have 16 hats for each di position difference. So, because you can, in the, when you're, and then remember the relative position embedding was something that you do on top of the attention, when not the input side. So, and then when you're performing attention, what, what, what matters is how far they are, the two tokens that you're performing the attention. So then, then let's say you're given the distance between these tokens to be uh, say um, X, then, well, I mean, let's say you're trying to go up to 128, what, what that, that's what the T5 is doing. Then, then in that case, then, um, you're considering the relative position of up to 128, then, and also you have a six, say you have 16 heads, then the number of parameters for the relative position embedding will be how much? 128 times 16, right? So um, that's the number of parameters that you have for the relative, relative position embedding here. But they basically just add this to the each logic of the attention. So it's very simple. Um, so I'll just give you the equation again. So um, remember that the attention mechanism was, um, remember this equation? So that was the attention mechanism, right? So attention of uh, QKV is equal to softmax of QK transpose V over um, square root D. Actually, my, my, my bad. what I'm saying is softmax is actually outside of that. So right. And um, so what, what they're saying is that they want to add um, these parameters per head. So this is actually single head equation. So this is an equation for each head. And of course, we'll have a, a bit more complicated equation for multi head. But let's say we're just considering the single head, then this equation translates into simply and QKT over square root D is the, these logits, right? Um, I mean, QK, Q, QK transpose are the logits, but uh, this will be basically um, D by the, major, I mean, not D by D, sorry, the sequence length is T then um, T by T matrix. And we want to just add Uh, parameters. Let's say that this is uh, these are multi portion embeddings. So let's say let's call this R, and R is also t by t matrix. And these are these this is actually parameters that are learnable. And because t can be arbitrarily long, what they do is that they only have embeddings up to one twenty eight, and after that they just have a fixed embeddings. So uh, in practice, if you look at into, get into this R matrix, then um, this will be, of course, um, some matrix, but it goes only, only up to say 128. And the rest will be just exactly the same. There are just basically just the um, same embedding, same, same parameter, even if it's longer. So um, 
that's just the um, same embeddings here. You can think of this as almost like a, just like a uh, null or something that doesn't really exist. But um, at, at, in practice, they actually make this into an embedding. But what's really meaningful is uh, whatever you have here. OK, so any question about this? So, uh, it, so this can still, so the important thing to notice is that this can still model uh, long-term dependency through multiple layers because apparently um, you, you can only model, of course, the, for each layer, you can only model relationship between up to sentence uh, uh, with the distance of 128. But then uh, in the second layer, then now you can actually have uh, interaction between the interaction. So basically it's kind of meta interaction, right? The interaction between the interaction between the tokens. So you can now model even longer longer term dependency. So that's what T5 is saying that they're in practice be able to model much longer dependency than 128 since we have multiple layers. And that kind of makes sense. Basically it's making kind of hierarchical, right? Because um, Initially, you're only looking into in the first layer, maybe you're only looking into relationship between nearby words. But then after you have defined these relationship of nearby words, then in the second layer, you're looking into more coarse grain, maybe like paragraph level. So um, again, so the details, there are more details. Actually, I, I recommend you to look into the paper. Um, Actually, today I have to actually go out a bit early. So with instead of having a five minute break, I'll just continue on the, uh, the rest of the lecture and probably end before 10 a.m. Um, so T5 is, um, it's worth actually looking into the paper too. I uh, also put the link on the website. It's very long paper, by the way, compared to BERT because uh, they actually submitted this to journal. So they just didn't want to omit some details because um, they wanted to be very, very comprehensive about what they want to say. But it's very easy reading. So I uh, recommend you to look, take a look at that when you have time. Another thing is that they use a very large scale corpus called um, Colossal Clean Crawl Corpus or C4. It's a clean version of the common crawl and they only use English for the T5 Later, they created um, multilingual T5 or some other languages. It was a straightforward thing because the, this common crawl has a lot of languages. Then for T5, they only filter English ones, but then they can filter different languages for um, different language versions of T5. And they used sentence piece tokenized instead of word piece in BERT. That means then they treat even the space as a regular character and apply the sentence piece tokenizer on the entire sentence instead of the each word where the each word is basically um, Python's split function, which means splitting by Y spaces. Another interesting aspect of uh, T5 is that they did the multitask learning um, after pre-trained language model. So, in BERT, let's say you were training for um, QA, of course you still bring the, the original language model, I mean the pre-trained language model, but then you fine tune that for each specific task with the task specific layer. So then at the end, uh, you'll, your model will be different for every task and you will have a different target specific layer. So you cannot really combine them in an easy way. But then what T5 was trying to do was that they wanted to translate or convert every NLP problem into a text to text format. So that's like, a, a that's actually not super new. There has been approached before too in a pre bird era too. They tried to make everything into sick to sick. But I think T5 was the first in a, uh, in trying to do this in a such large scale and also in a preaching language model way. So the, the good thing about this is that the problem formulation becomes very easy. Um, you know, let's say you're doing machine translation, uh, you just have to put some instruction at the, at, the, at the front, translate English to German, that is good. Then uh, the model will be able to actually realize that this is a translation task and accordingly output that 
it's well, just like German, I don't really uh, know how to <laughs> pronounce, but um, basically some German sentence corresponding to that is good. Um, but then you can do other tasks too, like uh, maybe sentence classification, they actually put the name of the task and then it's doing pretty well. Uh, they do an, again, uh, put the name of the task at the front and then it does well. And um, they can do summarization too, say summarize colon, uh, and then it does well. But note that um, if you know GPT-3 or something that follows after this, it's not actually doing in a few shot or zero shot way. What they're trying to say is that um, they have a, a, the a fine tuning of uh, the, the training examples for each task. So they have a, a lot of examples for uh, machine translation, summarization, but instead of training those on training on training those tasks independently, they use one model to train on all of these at the same time. And then they're testing this uh, with uh, in a task and agnostic way. And they said that it's doing pretty well without actually using task specific models. That's the really good part. You can save a lot of uh, space and also it becomes just you have to just call this model for your inference, right? Uh, you don't have to have a task specific model. So it's good in terms of uh, saving storage and also saving the computational cost. It's not necessarily always a better accuracy, but um, they saw that there is some generalization happening. And later this actually basically translates, um, there are some other works that uh, extends this to um, future learning or zero shell learning like T0 or some other more recent work, which is uh, still not scope of this class, but um, if you're interested, then you might want to look into those things too. But anyways, this was the, one of the first work that tried to convert every task into a single format so that becomes very easy to handle. All right, so lastly is uh, T5 results. So basically T5 was mostly tested on the classification task and also machine translation task. So if you look at this glue, cola, SST, these are all the classification tasks. So actually glue contains all these tasks. So they have the glue average, but then glue average is average of uh, cola, SST, to MRPC, uh, all these um, in the indiv individual sentence classification tasks. Some of them actually get two sentences instead of one sentence like MNLI. So these tasks basically ask the model to whether the first sentence entails the second sentence, et cetera. It's binary task classification. But as you see, um, this task basically um, gets pretty good results with T5 11 billion and it beats most of the previous best by as you see with the bold prints. So they were able to increase the glue average, which was a very popular benchmark back then um, to measure the, um, the, the um, how good a certain classification, general purpose classification model is like BERT. And these days they're not using it because they think it's too much saturated. They are now reaching above human performance and they think they need more harder tasks than this. They do pretty well also on uh, QA tasks like squad. Uh, they were able to uh, achieve state of the art. Um, it's like now 96.2 and 22% F1, which is really crazy given that this is like a, you know, QA system that even humans get wrong a lot. Um, they also tested on super glue average. Super glue is something that they they, they created after, they they not the T five people but uh, people created the community created after uh, glue got saturated. That okay, we need a harder one. But now T five was actually able to beat this a lot by like uh, four four point three percent points, and some other tests too, like um, that you might want to look into, and. It's worth noting that they did pretty well on the, um, not, not actually pretty well on the summarization, as you see, um, some improvements, but not so well on the machine translation, uh, for especially like uh, English to, 
I, I, I forgot what this RO was, but um, I mean, they're pretty doing not too badly. Um, they're pretty doing actually approaching the previous best on these um, English, uh, German and English French, but you need to know that Machine translation has very, uh, it's very hot area that a lot of people work on it to achieve state of the art. Um, there are models that are specifically dedicated towards doing well on machine translation. And it's really uh, amazing that T5 is approaching that accuracy. And this T5 is something that everyone can use very easily without any um, hassles. Whereas this machine translation models are very uh, oftentimes tuned a lot. So it's really great because you, now that means that if you have a, some multilingual T5, you can just use that on your machine translation without any hassles if you train on that. Another direction that uh, sprang from T5, really interesting direction is actually closed book QA, what's called closed book QA. So until now, we were thinking that these pre-trained language models are for learning the linguistic features or linguistic understanding ability. But they actually found that, actually there were some other work before this that actually found um, this phenomenon, which is the fact that language models not only really learn the linguistic features, but also because they're trying to guess missing words. For instance, they, if, for a bird to do well, it has to guess, let's say the sentences like Barack Obama was born in and mask then the, in, order, in, order, in order for the model to guess this right, it means then the model has to know when the Bar, uh, Bar Obama was born. Now we're seeing that the language model is playing a role, uh, playing a knowledge-based role, because sometimes you can ask the model to inquire about the world and it's able to tell you the answer sometimes. What that means is then the T5, what they were thinking after T5 is that the similar people who were involved T5, actually it's did, did, the different paper, this robots at all, not the Raphael at all, right? Um, they're thinking that maybe T5 contains the, still contains the information about the world. Then how about after pre-training, can we just fine tune the model on QA data set like squad or natural questions, but without the context? which means this model, whether this model is able to answer questions without referring to external text database explicitly. And they found that this works kind of, that let's say after training this model on, um, for instance, um, after fine tuning on this, like these pairs, when was Franklin D. Roosevelt born, and the answer is 1882. If you actually fine tune on these pairs, then um, they found that T5 is able to do well on some question answering tasks. It's, it really, was really amazing in the sense that now people were seeing that these language models can be knowledge bases. Some, some, some model, that this can contain the knowledge, knowledge of, about the world, but also the criticisms exist uh, the model does not does well only when the questions were seen during training, although it's a bit too extreme to say this. Um, I mean, not only, actually it's too much. Um, usually, so it doesn't do well usually when the questions were not seen during training, which means there is a lot of overlap between training and test data of these popular QA tasks like uh, natural questions or trivia QA. But it's still, uh, but still, it's true that the knowledge, the language model can be also knowledge based. So it's not entirely false that T five can do closed book QA. It's just that it's not as good as they thought initially. So I think that's it for today. We're ending the class a bit early today. So um, if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer. But otherwise. Um, um, I'm going to end the lecture here. So uh, basically, we'll uh, in the lab session on Thursday, we're going to do a similar thing with T5 that we did with birds in last Thursday. So you're going to actually try to see how the T5 works, uh, uh, how the fine tuning works, and uh, you will see that actually works pretty well uh, without much uh, effort, especially if you're using the hugging face. Um,
And next lecture will be about GPT-2, which is basically just the um, using the decoder, not, not encoder decoder, but just the decoder to do language model, um, to do language modeling. And that basically means that you can generate some sentence, a coherent sentence given some prefix. And we're gonna play with that in the next lecture a bit. I mean, next lab, I'm mean, not next lab, but lab 11. So lab 10, lab 10 will be this Thursday, it will be about T5. Lecture, lecture 11 and lab 11 will be about GPT-2. And then um, a week after that will be our last um, class, which is just wrapping up, um, talking about recent trends and also um, our lab session for the, the, the last lab session will be um, actually presenting the some final projects. Actually, we don't have that many final projects, so we'll have um, enough time to actually talk about your final project and also probably we'll be ending that class early enough so that you can prepare for your final exam in other classes too. Okay, so thanks a lot. So I'll see you on Thursday.